So Michelangelo, a lot like Leonardo, was a master of more than one discipline, uh, a painter, a sculptor, an architect, and even some of his poetry wasn't all that bad. But certainly the three great things, being an architect, a painter, and a sculptor. Now, he very much considered himself a sculptor first and foremost. Um, and of course, he is famous for some great paintings, The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel and the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, of course. Uh, both of those are in the middle and the end of his life, which I'll be speaking about next time. But he didn't really consider himself a great painter, although posterity history has decided he is. Well, he is, of course. Uh, but no, sculpting, sculpting, first and foremost, was what he considered himself great at. And uh, he is certainly one of the best to ever do it. The, the, well, I'll come to it later, but the Pieta in St. Peter's, I consider one of the greatest sculptures ever done. Um, so, like last time, uh, I was reading a lot from the lives of Vasari. And I asked you guys for comments or feedback on whether it was too much reading or whether you'd want more reading, or whether it was about just right. And uh, the general consensus was that it was fine. And there were a few comments saying it was too much. So what I decided I'm going to do is for this one, for Michelangelo, I'll do about the same amount of reading, again, from Vasari's lives. Uh, but for the next, the next topic, where I talk about the Medici family, a couple of centuries plus, I think what I'll do is maybe no quotes, no reading, and just do it entirely in my own words, because it's much more of, it'll be much more of an overview. Um, so I'm going to do it that way, and we'll see how that works out, and you let me know what you prefer. So a quick word on the sources before I jump in. Um, there is Vasari. Now, Vasari knew Michelangelo and very much admired him, looked up, looked up to him. Michelangelo lived to be very old. He lived to be 90 or 89 years old. And when Vasari wrote his life of Michelangelo, I mean, Vasari even worked on Michelangelo's tomb, considered him a, a close friend, actually, not just a mentor, but a friend. Uh, Michelangelo got to read the first draft or the first version of Vasari's lives of himself as a very old man. And he didn't like it particularly. He thought Vasari had underemphasized certain, certain things or hadn't done him justice, particularly around the issue of the tomb of Michelangelo designed and built for Pope Julius II. He wasn't happy with some of the narrative, the way Vasari dealt with some elements of his life. So Michelangelo actually commissioned somebody else to do another biography of him, Ascanio Condivi. Um, and so that was where Michelangelo got Condivi to write another biography that he was happy with, that he, Michelangelo, was happy with. Uh, Vasari later rewrote his, his life of Michelangelo um, so that it was much more in line with Condivi's account and therefore Michelangelo's wishes. So Vasari's account of Michelangelo's life is a lot longer than Leonardo's one, um, so I won't be reading nearly all of it, which I did for Leonardo. Uh, but remember, though, again, it is a, a hagiography. It's even more than in the case of Leonardo, in fact. Vasari kind of loved Michelangelo. He absolutely wanted to paint him in the best possible light. And again, he's being paid by the Medici family. So there's a few instances when suddenly we skip ahead a few years and it's just completely omitted. He just, Vasari just completely misses out whole bits of history, really, that are, are, are embarrassing to the Medici, or at least uh, don't paint the Medici in the best possible light. Um, so when that happens, I'll sort of just interject and tell you what really happened. So to begin at the beginning of Michelangelo's life, Vasari tells us this, the benign ruler of heaven, God, graciously looks down to earth saw the worthlessness of what was being done, the intense but utterly fruitless studies, and the presumption of men who were, who were further from true art than night is from day, and resolved to save us from our errors. So he decided to send into the world an artist who would be skilled in each and every craft, whose work alone would teach us how to attain perfection in design by correct drawing and by the use of contour 
and light and shadows, and so to obtain relief in painting, and how to use right judgment in sculpture and in architecture. Create buildings which would be comfortable and secure, healthy, pleasant to look at, well proportioned, and richly ornamented. Moreover, he, still talking about God, determined to give this artist the knowledge of true moral philosophy and the gift of poetic expression, so that everyone might admire and follow him as their perfect exemplar in life, work and behaviour, and in every endeavour, and he would be acclaimed as divine. So there we can see Vasari is not being entirely truthful, because he describes Michelangelo as, as an exemplar in life, that everyone should follow his behaviour. Michelangelo was quite badly behaved in all sorts of times. There's all sorts of accounts that people aren't being paid to make him look good, say that he was very rude and unpleasant and mean and difficult to be around and even a bit nasty, occasionally sometimes violent. So his life certainly wasn't a perfect example of how everyone should behave. But there you go, we have to be a bit careful with Vasari. Vasari continues, he, God, also saw that in the practice of these exalted disciplines and arts, namely painting, sculpture and architecture, the Tuscan genius has always been preeminent. For the Tuscans have devoted to all the various branches of art more labour and study than all the other Italian peoples. And therefore he chose to have Michelangelo born a Florentine, so that one of her own citizens might bring to absolute perfection the achievements for which Florence has already justly, was already justly renowned. So Michelangelo was born to a sort of a middling family. They weren't peasants, uh, but they certainly weren't rich. They were of some social standing, uh, but they, they weren't rich. And that comes up later in life. But most of the money he made, he sort of gave to his family. His, his father was something of a, an authoritarian. It seems he did beat Michelangelo sometimes. Um, but the main story is that he's, they had so many children that within a year or two of Michelangelo being born, um, they gave him to a wet nurse to go and live with another family for like the first 10 years of Michelangelo's life, roughly. Um, and, and they're sort of very important years, you know. By the time you're 10, um, you know, your character isn't set or anything, but, you know, your memories have kicked in. Um, it's a really important part of your life. And so the family of this wet nurse were involved in stone cutting, in the, in the business and the art of cutting stone and marble. And uh, apparently this played an important part in Michelangelo's earliest memories. And he's supposed to have said this about it later to a friend. This is an actual quote of Michelangelo. He's supposed to have said, Giorgio, if my brains are any good at all, it's because I was born in the pure air of your Arezzo countryside, just as with my mother's milk I sucked in the hammer and chisels I used for my statues. Obviously as a metaphor, um, you know, that he was raised on his mother's milk and the sound of stone marble being cut, um, that he breathed in the very marble dust. Um, it's, it's his earliest thing, you know, sort of saying it's in my blood. If I know anything, it's, it's, it's about sculpture, being a, a sculptor. Michelangelo's father was called Lodovico, Lodovico Brunarotti. And it seems a bit very much like Leonardo's father. He wanted the best for his son, but thought that, um, you know, drawing and painting and being a sculptor is fairly lowly. In those times, even though you could be proclaimed a genius if you were one of the very, very best, usually it was quite a lowly trade. You probably wouldn't make a great deal of money out of it unless you, you know, you know, you were lucky to get massive commissions and make loads of money out of it. Um, it was a craft. It was just a craft. It was a workman, a workmanly thing to do, to be an artist. And Lodovico wanted more for his son than that. And to begin with, was sort of aghast that Michelangelo, all he wanted to do was draw. Um, I think of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, you know, where Michelangelo might be like, but, but father, I just want to draw. And the, the stern father's like, you know, we'll have none of that. There'll be no drawing in this household. You'll learn a proper trade. Uh, but it, it, it seems that all Michelangelo wanted to do, was obsessed with really, in the first instance, was drawing. 
um, because you probably want to be a good draftsman, a good drawer uh, before you're a sculptor. It comes later. Fasari goes on. As time passed and Lodovico's family grew bigger, he found himself as he enjoyed only a modest income in very difficult circumstances. And he, he had to place his sons in turn with the wool and silk guilds. When Michelangelo was old enough, he was sent to the grammar school to be taught by a Francesco of Urbino. Uh, but he was so obsessed by drawing that he used to spend on it all the time that he possibly could. As a result, he used to be scolded and sometimes beaten by his father and the older members of the family, who most likely considered it unworthy of their ancient house for Michelangelo to give his time to an art which meant nothing to them. But eventually, it became clear to old Lodovico that Michelangelo wouldn't, wouldn't stop drawing. Again, a bit like Leonardo. The boy seemed sort of obsessed with it, almost couldn't stop. He would, you know, skip school, go truant from school just to go to a church and do sketches of the art that he saw. And in the end, the family, it seemed, with Lodovico, thought, well, we may as well lean into it. Because again, like Leonardo, the father saw the drawings the boy was producing and it was sort of obvious, it was absolutely obvious that he had natural skill, natural talent. So in the end, in like Leonardo, his father took him to Florence to see if he could get him enrolled in one of the, one of the great artistic workshops. And so he was taken to the workshop of Domenico Gerlandeo, who, like Verrocchio in Leonardo's case, was among the best there was in Florence. So to sort of get him on Gerlandeo's books was a real boon for, for the young Michelangelo. And, and, and Domenico Gerlandeo, uh, like Verrocchio, saw the talent in the boy. It, it, was just, it was just obvious. Quick thing I must say, because I've made so many parallels there with Leonardo already, is that Michelangelo is about, is, what is he, 25 odd years younger. So he was born in uh, the mid 70s, the mid 1470s, a couple of years, just a couple of years before uh, Giuliano de' Medici was murdered in the, in the church that time. So Michelangelo was about two odd when that happened. So his childhood or sort of early teenage years in Florence, when he was sort of first trying to come up through the ranks, trying to make his name as a, as a budding artist or as a budding artist's apprentice. It was the time in Florence when Lorenzo the Magnificent was ruling on his own, the last handful of years of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And Lorenzo the Magnificent was, uh, of course, uh, a great patron of the arts. And he was always on the lookout for any new great talent. And eventually Michelangelo caught his eye. And so Michelangelo's whole life took a turn for the, for the better, really. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.